Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Seaweed Generation podcast. We have the tremendous honour of welcoming Arika Hill, who is the director of the Environmental Awareness Group in Antigua and Barbuda, which is one of the more beautiful countries on Earth. Arika, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, we are we're just so excited to hear about all the incredible work that you have been doing and we know all about this um, and I know we've spent lots of time talking about it but we wanted to record it and spread the word of the um, mm -hmm. of what you're doing so um, in your own words we'd love to hear a bit more about what it is that the EAG does and um, we particularly would love to chat about Redonda and the amazing work that you have been able to do there so without further ado take it away and then we'll interrupt okay. with more questions as we go. Sure. So the EAG is Antigua and Barbuda's longest standing environmental NGO. So we've actually been doing conservation since 1989. Um, and mm -hmm. our really hard, kind of real hard start in conservation began in 1995 when we brought the critically endangered endemic Antigua and Raysa from the brink of extinction. So it's this beautiful little snake, absolutely mm. adorable. Um, it can only be found in Antigua and Barbuda, but the population had dropped to 50 individuals. So that's five zero individuals. And they could oh, only wow. be found on one offshore island. And I think that's kind of interesting from the standpoint that when you think of, you think of a Caribbean island, you don't think mm -hmm. that a Caribbean island has almost like baby islands. So Antigua and Barbuda has 51 baby islands all around it that are uninhabited, right? Wow. Um, That's more baby islands than there were snakes left. <laughs> correct. That's, That's pretty that, endangered, yeah. isn't it? Wow. That's pretty There's only one island that had two snakes on it, and they were very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have, um, they were all found on this one island, which is Great Bird Island, which is... Um, on the northeast side of the the country, and what we did was that we, which is kind of the model for EAG generally, mm -hmm. we identify a problem, we identify how we can find the solutions to it, and we bring in as many pe people and partners as possible to save and kind of like get this work mm -hmm. done really well. What we found out really was that the racer was kind of about to be gone forever because of rats and mongooses. Mm. So invasive invasive species has consistently been like the biggest challenge for biodiversity, especially within the Caribbean. You know, mm -hmm. when you think of the Caribbean, we've lost um, nearly 60, 67% of our biodiversity just from invasive wow. alien species. Um, and that's across the Caribbean. That's not just Antigua and Barbuda. So it's, it's, right. it's a really significant problem. And what EAG has been able to do is that we go into the islands, we remove rats, we remove mongooses, we remove other mm -hmm. invasive species. So that's sometimes a goat, sometimes that's chickens. Um, we make sure that the islands are especially mammalian invasive species free. And mm -hmm. as soon as you do that, I am not kidding you. What you see is like this island is like dying it's crumbling there's like no birds nothing like it's honestly dead remove mm -hmm. those invasive species you see birds come back lizards are popping mm -hmm. the island the vegetation <laughs> just goes like Shh, and everything oh, becomes wow. beautiful again oh, um, lizards, i love it's it's pretty dramatic it's pretty mm -hmm. dramatic um and i so we do this <laughs> thing where we take fixed point pictures right so yeah we take a picture at the same spot um, using the same environmental conditions all the time. Mm -hmm. And that for us is a really great, a, a, just a great visual track of how things are going. Great Bread Island, when you started in 1995, you saw the island had like these huge patches of like sand or like mm. rubble. And same spot in 2012, Lush. It's, wow. Lush. It's perfect. Just... Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Fantastic. So, 
So we've actually done that on um, 16 offshore islands where we've gone mm -hmm. in, we've removed rats and mongooses. And what we do is that we kind of create this network um, because we understand that rats are very good swimmers. They can mm -hmm. swim for an hour before they get tired. So you really have to make oh, sure that no, you no, are no. not. Yeah. Oh, they're great. And not just swim, you know, Patty, they dive. <laughs> oh, how deep do they dive? Oh. I don't even know, but it's like I've you see them and they just they oh, just go man. in. They're really okay. good. Sorry, really good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> and that's the picture we'll use on the uh, promo. Yeah, team. all of us doing that. Right? Amazing. <laughs> us swimming like rats. Great. <laughs> If only um, I could swim like a rat, I mean. <laughs> I so think, how, honestly. How much monitoring do you do around the islands in the sort of, in, in the water? I mean, have you ever seen the rats swimming? We actually have. Wow. We've mm. seen a rat and we've seen a mongoose um, and we deal with it as swiftly as possible. Mm. Wow. Okay. So 16 islands, you've had a rehabilitative hand rehabilitative hand in yes, thus far yes. um and uh yeah. well i suppose in in many ways it's a story of the eag versus the mongoose or the rat yes um so tell us about <laughs> i know redonda was quite similar and that's your sort of most recent triumph tell us more yeah. about that and the work that was done there so we take the same model right mm -hmm. of you go in you do um the removal of rats in this case and goats as well. Um, mm. So I think the thing about Redonda is that we we understand all of these islands are uninhabited, but mm -hmm. Redonda used to be inhabited, right? So right. unlike the other islands, it actually used to um, have miners on it because of the fact that Redonda holds 1% of the world's brown boobies. So it's covered with a lot of bird poop. So <laughs> it's, right. a, it's okay. a fantastic spot for birds. So you've got a lot of nesting boobies, both brown boobies and masked boobies. You've got, um, you have a lot of frigate birds. Just it's, it's almost like a little wildlife wander right mm -hmm. and because it had all of those birds nesting there it was a great spot for guano so people right. were mining yeah. for that good guano and using it in um, gunpowder and all sorts of things so people used to live there and where people exist where ships exist mm -hmm. rats okay. exist right um when the guano mining ended they left the island but they didn't go, hey, let me just collect all the rats and take them with me, right? They just left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nobody's Classic. like, let me pack these up. <laughs> yeah, come on, rats, let's go. <laughs> um, and we had goats on the island, not because mm -hmm. Redonda pre predominantly has goats, but because that is a part of our colonial history where mm -hmm. what, what sailors would do is that they'd put um goats on islands as a as like a poor man's way a sailor's way of being of surviving so if mm -hmm. in case you ever got stranded there's meat on the island right so there were goats on the island but because of the rats and how the rats were eating the vegetation and the goats and the birds and how the goats were eating the vegetation because goats actually don't eat they eat everything like they rip everything right, right. out of the root. So mm -hmm. it's not even like a, I'm just going to eat the tops. It's I when I eat, there's nothing left. So between oh, the God. two of them, they completely devastated yes. the island. Oh, wow. What did Mike say? Like, he said he like, like that. that. <laughs> <laughs> or like teenagers. <laughs> so, I mean, th these are all sort of invasive species that are sort of decimating the region, really. And I guess, you know, we met each other through Sargassum, which is another right. I mean, mm -hmm. How are you, you guys working with, with the Sargassum influx? Because that's a strange one, isn't it? Because you'll never be able to remove it all. Yeah, it's 
I think Sargassum, it's a different kind of beast. Um, mm -hmm. with 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 mammals, especially, there's a clear way of dealing with um the removal of those species. And even on Redonda, we are challenged with the removal of guinea grass um, as an invasive species as well. Plants are a very weird thing to tackle. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but even with the guinea grass, like we, we know how, mm -hmm. and you can put in measures that yes, will take a long period of time, but you kind of figure out, okay, I know what to do. Sargassum is not one of those. It's not one that you can say, okay, like with guinea grass, I think this is an easy example. We've figured out like one of the ways that we're tackling it is so through soil solarization, which really means that you kind of put this blanket over the grass and the blanket gets really hot and kills the grass underneath it. And mm -hmm. so you're able to but you have to leave it for a very long time, long enough so that the seeds as well die, and then you remove it. And you're hoping then that we will then reforest the area with native plants. So you're right. you're able to kill the area and then replenish it with um, what really existed there before. Mm -hmm. But that's a controlled space. The ocean is not controlled by anyone. Um, and so sargassum is one that we we actually don't have a solution for. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the areas where we do work, so like I think about Redonda, thankfully sargassum is not a, a big issue around there. The currents are very active. There are no, sh there are no real shores for mm -hmm. it to wash up on and, and become a problem. So thankfully for Redonda, that's not an issue. Um, closer to home within our Northeast Marine Management Area, it's a huge issue. And it's an issue not just from a biodiversity standpoint, but from a human health um, standpoint right. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I guess a lot of sargasm conversations are framed in terms of economics and sort of the impacts on the tourism industry and mm -hmm. yes, and, and human, human health, of course, is really important as well. From a biodiversity perspective, what have you seen in areas impacted by sargasm? So, I mean... I guess it's a mixed bag, right? Because when it's out in its patches, you're kind of like, you understand that sargassum itself is a floating ecosystem. So it's very hard, I think, as well to immediately pose it as a problem because it does serve an ecosystem function, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have juvenile um it's going to be a, a great place for small fishes to be able to survive and kind of tuck themselves away, away from predators. Um, there, For us, we are also kind of looking at it as, is this a potential spot for where tiny turtles are able to kind of live for a period in those years when you're not sure where they are? Because like, <laughs> there's, there's literally a gap in scientific knowledge as to where do these baby turtles go for like a good period? We're just like, where are you? Where where have you gone? Have <laughs> where you, did you go? Like, where did you go? And then all of a sudden you pop back up like, hey, babe, I I'm here. Like, <laughs> where were you all the time? You know? And it, there are questions about whether they actually kind of live in those sargassum mats and they're, you know, living and foraging and kind of becoming juveniles. Mm -hmm. baby like teenagers getting to teenagers <laughs> yeah you know and there's like this is safe space no nobody's gonna really eat us here whatever so at that end you're kind of like wow so I got some great little ecosystem interesting mm -hmm. from a biodiversity standpoint um no problems and then it washes into your bay and it just has nowhere to go and that's when it kind of all devolves a bit mm -hmm. and it it starts to decay. It starts to like literally become this 
place where everything under it is not able to survive. And it doesn't make sense. Because mm-hmm. it's like, how did you come from being absolutely perfect to absolute terror after a little bit? And I mean, so we haven't seen, I think, a whole lot of like fish kills. We have seen in some instances, um, some of those same juvenile turtles that we're concerned about kind of tacked into um, sargassum that they're not able to get around from, which right. they normally would have. Um, I've had reports of, like on one of our one of the offshore islands, there's a really great sea turtle program that has been going on for at least 30 years. So that's the Jumbi Bay Hawksville Project. A really mm-hmm. old, it's, I think it's the oldest sea turtle uh, monitoring program within the Caribbean region. So successful program, excellent work. We're seeing um, mothers and daughters nesting on the same beach, which is, you know, that's oh, really interesting oh. from a scientific standpoint. It's really great mm-hmm. stories. And that beach now has the island is inundated by sargassum and you're seeing turtles unsure of where they can nest right Right. because they can't they can't get through all of that it's not it's not compact enough for them to climb over um and you can see them kind of making decisions about okay can i actually nest here and so the question then becomes do they because some 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 turtles are like, okay, I might not be able to nest on this exact spot, but within this same area, I can nest. We don't know if those turtles are choosing to nest on a neighboring offshore island or if they are just evacuating the eggs into the sea because they can't nest. Right. So then it's a question now about what is the impact of um of sargassum on the survival of a species just in general and we already know that sea turtles are critically endangered so right yeah i mean i guess the problem is with those that lost years you've got a delay where you can't yeah. track the numbers out and you think about the sargassum and how it's been in and they have been for 15 20 years mm-hmm. it's you don't know the impact when it started and mm-hmm. maybe too late before we realize yeah i suppose we're getting to the point now where we'll start to see the beginning of the sargasm being very bad having that impact and we'll mm-hmm. start to be able to understand it but it might you know a bit that's a bit scary anyway <laughs> it is scary um, it's not it's not a fun a fun topic but it is it's also I mean so another I think the most research that we've seen um and thank god for the Jim B. Bay Sea Turtle Project because at least mm-hmm. they have like this ongoing program of having students coming in and so they can really track the research around it um but one of the things that they're wondering as well is whether the smell and the chemicals that come off of the sargassum are also having an impact on the turtles themselves, like whether they're able to, like, is it making them go slightly, not bonkers, because I feel like bonkers is a strong statement, but is it causing them to be a little disoriented just a bit more so they don't know what, what to do because the smell is weird for them? So it's yeah, many it's quite toxic, that... isn't it? As well, it is. Yes, you've also so, got the temperature so issue as well, haven't you? With the, the seaweed blankets and the beaches, and whether that's having an impact on the, the on the nesting as well. Yes, yeah. So lots of it's questions. a huge. It's lots a lot of questions. questions. A lot of yeah. Questions. Um. So. Let's stay. Let's stay in the sea for a minute. Um, mm-hmm. When we when we last hung out, you were on your way to, I think, also Redonda, but the ocean around it to do some observations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you said already that the oceans is really hard from a you know an environmental invasive rehabilitation perspective. But do you have hopes and dreams and you know things that you would like to do? If if I gave you a huge patch of ocean and said, Arika, 
make it more biodiverse or rehabilitate this area what would you do oh okay so um so i i would start with this and say that while i accept that there are many challenges eag in general kind of we preach a discipline of hope right mm -hmm. so we are very much aware of yes we're aware of our limitations but we are aware of what is also in our hand and our ability to do quite a lot. So we are still, you know, we're never doom and gloom and we're not doom and gloom because that. we know that we can, we can make a difference and we've seen mm -hmm. it. All right. Um, so for one thing, we already do actually have a huge patch of ocean that we are managing. Um, so in Amazing. August last year, um, Redonda became designated as a protected area and we are now managing 30,000 hectares of land and sea. Um, it's only one mile of that is is sea, is land, sorry. So 98% <laughs> of, of the Redonda Ecosystem Reserve is actually the marine space. Um, so it's great. Wonderful. It's about the, okay. It's about the size of Antigua. So very interesting. Um <laughs> Also very interesting from the standpoint that um, we've been able to manage the relationship between us and the government of Antigua and Barbuda. And they've been like, look, you have been at the forefront of conservation for so long. You do the day-to-day -day management and just report to us. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're in that very sweet spot of being an NGO that's managing a protected area, which is fantastic. Marvelous. Um, well done. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so right now, you know, a part of what we've been doing, um, and my team actually just did a, a bit of a marine survey last week as well. We're constantly trying to just get data. So mm -hmm. we believe very strongly that science must be the thing that directs your management decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it's very possible to... You know, I think with environment, especially, it's it's an emotional thing, right? Um, yeah. And emotion, while it's a great thing, is also the thing that can derail your projects because you get so caught up in, but I want to see this thing. I love it, blah, 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 without understanding all of the things that go along with it. Like, if right. you don't understand then you can make decisions that will actually screw things up. Yeah. So we are very firmly doing as much research as possible. So we have no answers. And I'm okay, okay. with that. I'm That's literally right. okay so you, with that. All right. <laughs> so you, you need all that baseline data to start to make decisions. Yes. How are you getting the data right now? Like what is, what is that? So like? how we're doing that is, is actually just going out to the sea. So mm -hmm. we've done marine surveys and that means that it's we've been training our staff to be able to do um, surveys on fish types and the benthic materials, so like what's on the actual sea floor. Um, mm -hmm. We wanna collect data on what's happening in terms of seagrass, in terms of um, coral cover. Are we actually seeing a connection between how we restored the land and what's happening on in the sea. Is there a beneficial correlation? Are we seeing a negative correlation? And if there what 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 do those what does all of this data mean in terms of not just a day-to-day -day management, but how do we um is there is is there active restoration that we need to do in the sea? Mm -hmm. Because as much as we've done, and I think this is a probably an interesting thing that often people don't recognize about the work that we've done on our, on any of the offshore islands. While we have removed invasive species, we've done no other active restoration. Right. So we've not gone in and planted trees. Mm -hmm. We've not gone in and done anything that is, I guess, to, to some extent invasive. What we've done is removed pressure and seen immediate impact, right? Mm -hmm. So for us to now 
do something that will require active restoration, we need to have as much information as possible before we decide that we're going to mess with nature. Right. Do you think it's going to need something active? I suppose, like, what's going on in the space right now? Is there activity? Um, Is there nothing going on? So we've seen, what we've seen is just, you know, very good coral, healthy coral. We've seen turtles, we've seen lots of sharks, um, which Mm -hmm. is, for us, a very good indication of a healthy Mm -hmm. ecosystem, right? Um, Because sharks are at that top of that food chain. If they're not there, there's nothing you know. to all those rats. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they I wish they actually were eating the rats. But anyway, that's that would make life easier. <laughs> you know, I mean ugh. but um but interestingly, like for instance around Redonda, there's been a consistent like from a fishery standpoint, we've always known that there is cigatera, which is like a fish poisoning, fish poison. Um, so it means it's not a great fisheries area. Right. Uh, So mm -hmm. don't be like, yeah, I'm going around Redonda and I'm going to throw out a net. Do not do that. Um, Because there's there's poison there? Yes. Yes. So the fish are fine. They're good. Will you be good? No. (laughs) Kind of makes it take care of itself, though, isn't it? Yeah. Probably. Probably. What a a response. Yeah. So it's kind of nice to hear, though, that you're interactions that are fairly minimal once you've removed those invasives and kind of when, like you said once you remove that pressure the environment does recover and does recover quickly so that kind of does give you hope for the region doesn't it but, but, yeah i mean it also yeah, sure. i think it tells us a, a really good story about conservation because i think we all feel like we need to go in and save nature right we have this feeling as environmentalists, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna save the world. I'm gonna save. Sometimes they just like just, just take away the thing that's mm-hmm. bothering me, and I'm good. I'm cool. I don't, I don't need a whole lot. <laughs> just take it away. If only everyone could be that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Um, okay, great. We are we are kind of getting to approximately time, um, but love to just ask you if there's if you could wave a magic wand and have mm. one thing that would help you to massively increase the positive impact that the EAG has, what would it be? And if anyone's watching, get in touch right. so we so can make I'm, it happen. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to be mm. like... EAG is a non-governmental organization. We are, uh, because of how we how we are able to do our work while we're doing very impactful work, all of our work is funded through us writing grants. Mm-hmm. None of it is through a delightful subvention from the government. We don't have unrestricted streams of income just coming our way and we're able just to do the work that we need to do. Every cent that we spend is raised through us writing to somebody and asking them for money. And that's exhausting. Um, And it takes so much of our time when the truth is that what we've been able to do for the past 30 years is really inspire a generation of of activists and, and environmentalists. And especially within the past five years, we have literally seen... Antiguans just run towards um, conservation and environmentalism, which is not something that is usual. Um, (laughs) I think we've been very lucky in the ability to change the face of conservation. Um, The fact that it looks like me, that it is Antiguans who sound like me, people from the Caribbean who are literally doing conservation work, That is a a very new model and it's exciting to us, but we need to be able to consistently fund it. We need to be able to consistently offer attractive salaries to people who want to come and do this kind of work. So my magic wand would be for us to be self-sustaining, to be um, consistently supported. And so if anybody wants to do that, you're like, yeah, man, I I have a couple million that's just follow, falling out of my back pocket. Or you have a couple tens that are falling out of your back pocket. I would say support the EAG 
You can follow us on Instagram at EAG Antigua. Follow us on Facebook, same at EAG Antigua. Mm -hmm. um, and just be a part of, of that level of support. And I think sometimes people think I have to come, I have to do all of this hard work. You don't have to. It's it it's don't feel badly if you can't come and save an Antiguan racer. You can't come and do give us the ten dollars. That's what will help to do that work. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, I love that this is um this is very much, you know, driven by you and the the face of AEAG and conservation in Antigua. Um and if anyone is out there with a couple of extra million, let's get in touch with Erika and yeah. <laughs> send it in their direction. <laughs> um amazing. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure as always. Um and we will we will catch up very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Yes. Bye.